the story of Hezbollah. That is not a story which is well known outside the spokesmanship of Hezbollah. So there are no other sources, as Tony said, about if you want to know the comprehensive, what I call genome of Hezbollah, that it had a beginning, it had an evolution, it had changes in the evolution, and then back to the original evolution. I divided quickly in seven stages for those who have not done um, uh, deep readings about it. Uh, the, the inception of Hezbollah was between 1980 and 1982, so before the Israeli occupation, and that disarms immediately the first argument. Uh, when Pasdaran, Iranian Revolutionary Guards, landed in Lebanon through Syria into the Bekaa Valley, in the northern Bekaa Valley, and tr began the establishment, it's a longer story than that, of what be would become Hezbollah. So there were several components, uh, Islamic Amal, the union of radical ulamas, what have you, put together, that was Hezbollah. Between 1982 and 1985, there was the clash between Hezbollah and first the multinational force and, of course, the Israelis, all the way to 1985 when the Israelis withdrew to what was known then as the security zone in the south. So there were three very important years where Hezbollah basically made itself as a force that can survive and can move forward with the returning forces, i.e. the pro-Syrian, pro-Union forces, into the vacuum left by the Israelis as they withdrew and as the Lebanese army didn't move forward. Third stage, between 1985-1990, uh, Hezbollah, in the areas that it controlled north of the security zone, established itself a enclave. And from that enclave, it conducted a static war against the security zone and the Israelis and in 1990, a major change, this time in the north, in Beirut, when uh, what was known as the East Beirut Enclave collapsed, and there was a formation of a new, more pro-Syrian government that, in 1990, gave Hezbollah actually the weapon, the legitimacy, it was known then by the Lebanese government as the Mokalma, as the resistance. So from 1990 on, things changed for Hezbollah. It could conduct operations, but it, it could also manage uh, villages that it controls on all levels, which I'm going to quickly uh, cover. Between 1990 and 2010, long years of Hezbollah efforts, sponsored still by the government, fighting against the security zone, until the dismantlement of the security zone and the withdrawal to the international border, that would lead Hezbollah to its peak power, Ajdor, the peak power of Hezbollah from 2005 till 2000, from 2000 till 2005. Now, what Hezbollah was able to do in the areas that it gradually took, conquered, it calls liberated, is a full-fledged, what I call in my book, jihadization. All aspects of life have been and are regulated by Hezbollah in the specific areas of its control. The military, the intelligence, the education, from the control of the Hausa and the Husayniyas, equivalent of the madrasas, public schools, private schools, the socio-economic cycle in those areas, the reconstruction process, uh, local state officials, and of course the media coverage. So from that very condensed answer, I would say that Hezbollah's first strength was to be able to move into an area, to secure it, to get the recognition of government that it's responsible for it, and number two, to actually manage life in that uh, area, which actually answers now the, the, the essence of the question. Uh, it is not that Hezbollah is one force sitting among other forces in that area. It is the only, it's a regime. It's a micro-regime within specific areas of Lebanon. It had a setback between 05 and 08, during what was known then the Cedars Revolution, which we could uh, discuss later, and it has a comeback since, 2000, since May of 2008 till now, back to what it was or, or so before 2008. And, Walid, one thing you alluded to in your remarks was uh, a setback that Hezbollah experienced. In the winter of 2005, uh, the Cedars Revolution's supporters marched in Beirut against Syrian occupation and also uh, against Hezbollah. Uh, since then, there's been a confrontation taking place between Hezbollah and a political coalition known as March 14th. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the rise of the Cedars Revolution, uh, Hezbollah's counterattack, and where things stand both inside Lebanon and also in the diaspora uh, regarding this struggle between Hezbollah and the opposing political alliance. Absolutely. The, this is actually a chapter of my new book, if I can publicize about it. It's today in the, in the market, uh, the, uh, the Coming Revolution, uh, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East. One chapter is dedicated to the Cedars Revolution. Um, in a nutshell, if we can, and we'll leave it to question and, and answers for, for, for those details, 
um, Hezbollah operated, as I narrated before, in a vacuum of uh, Lebanese counter, uh, uh, counter action, in a sense that Hezbollah marched under two conditions in order to be able to establish the Hezbollah land in Lebanon. One, an Israeli withdrawal, which was linked to many other things, and in Syrian Iranian advance, and an absence by the Lebanese army, which should have been the logical uh, agency to, to stop Hezbollah. And the areas that basically were resisting the Syrians were far away, were remote uh, from Hezbollah. So in that condition, Hezbollah was able to freely move throughout uh, Lebanon and secured its control up till 2000 all over the country in, in alliance, of course, with the Syrians and the others. Now, between 2000 and 2005, they were the beginnings of what would become the Cedars Revolution. Uh, these were the remnants of the actual anti-Syrian coalition uh, who throughout the 90s have been resisting in a very uh, non-violent way demonstrations and uh, uh, speeches and political activities in the diaspora for almost a whole decade. Now their work came to fruition in about 2003 at the time where the United States were in Iraq and was when Syria was basically trying to work against that presence in Iraq. So to make the story very short, there was an alignment of planets between the activities of Lebanese opposition to Syria on the inside. And when we say opposition to Syria, we, we include, of course, to Hezbollah. And the some pressures done by Lebanese opposition outside, plus the interests of the United States and France, all came into becoming, uh, of course, at the hands of the U.S. administration. Then the resolution, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1559. It changed the international ambiance in the sense that when the international legality of the Syrian occupation forces in Lebanon uh, went away, and with it the legitimacy of Hezbollah's weapons, because Resolu Resolution 1559 called for withdrawal of the Syrians, disarming of all militias, including Hezbollah, then the organization in Lebanon was exposed. What followed that, uh, what led to the 2005 Cedars Revolution, per se, on the ground, was a series of reactions by the Syrian regime. And we're going to see in a few weeks from now or so uh, the indictments that are going to be issued by the tribunal, we could talk about that uh, as well later, are going to expose this. But in fact, in 2005, Lebanon civil society rose, marched for the first time. And it was not just the traditional Christian community that, be, that has been traditionally opposed to Syria, but also masses of Sunni and Druze and some remnants of or small uh, contingents of Shia. That constituted the Cedars Revolution. Hezbollah was t totally surprised by two things, by the withdrawal of their immediate strategic protectors, the Syrians, that was A, all the way to Syria, and two, by this uh, unequal mass of opposition to Hezbollah, 1.5 million people or so, in a country of 4 million people or so, is just unseen, even, even in comparison with other demonstrations hap that has happened in the region. The psychological shock of these demonstrations, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1559, and immediate elections that followed in Lebanon in the spring and summer of 2005, that developed a majority known as the March 14 majority, all of these were actually the expression of the anti-Hezbollah feelings of the overwhelming majority of the Lebanese. Then, from July till 2008, there was a series of counterattacks by Hezbollah. But let's talk about the other counterattack, uh, Walid, the counterattack that was occurring at this time within Lebanon. You mentioned the most prominent assassination, uh, the Hariri assassination, that I cut you off as you were going to others. So let's look at this chapter of the saga of Hezbollah unfolding. You know, they've seen a domestic challenge within civil society and a very powerful one. Now, let, tell, tell, let's... Please tell us about how Hezbollah was able to strike back during the subsequent period. We have to tie this to the much wider picture of what we call the Axis, meaning in Lebanon at least, but of course in the region. Uh, these operations, these strategies, the management of these strategies falls into what is known in Arabic, the joint war room between the Syrian Mukhabarat, the Iranian Mukhabarat, Hezbollah's various agencies, and some of Lebanese state, Hezbollah, Syrian penetrated agencies. All of that works together. So most of these decisions, at least well in the 90s certainly, and 
all the way to the, the Harira assassination, were the product of that. There was coordination. Hezbollah does not wage, before 2005, major things, or the, uh, the Lebanese state major things without consultation with their allies because they want to know they operate in the same land. So number one. The Hariri assassination, as I said, which we're going to know more about, hopefully, in the next few weeks or so, uh, was most likely, now analytically speaking, in response to uh, the Syrian uh, nervousness about Resolution 1559 and what could ensue. Now, as a result of the Hariri assassination, there was the rise of the Cedars Revolution, which we all saw on TV. First, 50,000 Lebanese, for the first time in modern history, 50,000 only, took the streets of downtown Beirut, and that gave the signal to the international community <laughs> that there are segments in Lebanon that are not happy with Syria, that would want to implement 1559 and want to disarm Hezbollah. Hezbollah responded, and that's the first counterattack, counter which I did not mention yet, with what they thought would be a mass demonstration by Hezbollah allies on March 7, 8, thank you, we were together, uh, when we uh, looked at it. And they mustered with everything they could everything they've could, and the entire, also, Syrian workers' population in Lebanon controlled by the Ba'athists, and their supporters among the Palestinians, and everybody else, about 250,000, which was amazing, a big, big number in Lebanon. The international media, I remember I was interacting with it, trying to analyze the first spot of the Cedars Revolution, the 50,000 said, I mean, what are you talking about? The overwhelming majority of the people are with Hezbollah. One week later, seven business days later, March 14, 1.5 million people, you know, <laughs> filled the streets. There were no one single camera that could shoot the whole uh, uh, gathering. That was the shock because the Hezbollah analysis of this was, first of all, the world now knows that the majority of the people, whatever is the result of any election, is against them. And number two, they looked at this mass and know very well what this mass could produce in terms of real physical resistance if Hezbollah attacks them. That's how they thought. So instead of going directly against them, as of July till December, there was a series of assassinations, uh, beginning with Samir Kassir, a famous liberal journalist in Lebanon, George Howey, attempt against a female journalist, Naishid Yaq, could go on for, and it ended with Gibran Tuwaini, MP, a leading figure of the Cedars Revolution. The second six months, it was almost a game, well-prepared game of counterattacks. First, assassinations. So you are intimidating the NGOs of the Cedars Revolution. From January till July of 2006, Hezbollah said, okay, I'm ready to sit down and talk. They created the so-called round table, Tawl Hiwar. They wasted the time of, of, of Lebanese politicians for six months. And on the morning of July 2006, we all know what happened. Now, Hassan Nasrallah ordered the triggering of a war with Israel, which lasted a few, few days, few weeks, leading to Hezbollah claiming that they won the war, leading more urban disturbances. Calculate all these steps as counterattacks, counterattacks, and of course leading all the way to May 2008 when basically Hezbollah invaded half of the capital, half of Beirut was invaded and parts of the mountain. I would be very much happy to discuss what was the reaction of the Lebanese then, but I would conclude here that in 2008, May 2008, Hezbollah sort of crumbled the cabinet, the will of the cabinet, the national security will of the cabinet that was the result of March 14 political victory. And unfortunately, since that time, Hezbollah is on the rise further and further in Lebanon. Right. So, so the final question I'll put to the panel before I open up to Q&A from the floor is given this state of play and uh, given the inherent strengths of Hezbollah that Tony articulated, what can an outside force, you know, what can the United States or European countries that are concerned about what Hezbollah is doing within Lebanon do to counteract this way that it's subverted civil society through uh, the uh, use of force, through targeted assassinations and the like? Is there a concerted strategy? Or is this something where we have to resign ourselves to you know, an ever-strengthening and very malign presence within Lebanon? That question, I think we can begin answer, and of course the rest is going to be an interactive interplay because it has to do with multiple levels, multiple dimensions. And it has to do also with when are we talking about there are things that we could have done in the 80s and the 90s, before and after 2005 and before and after 2008. But let me just place a few, few points here. Um, 
to be to be candid and direct about it. You have there are two centers that can engage to counter Hezbollah outside the Israeli Hezbollah confrontation, which is of its own. And that's why I'm saying these are two different dimensions. If Hezbollah wages another confrontation with Israel, then it's the full fledged strength of Israel and its own strategies, which could be discussed. But at the present state, without Hezbollah and Israel entering another clash, uh, you have two points that can uh, put pressure, that can engage. One is within the Lebanese communities. It can't be from the moon, it can't be from all elsewhere. It has to be native, it has to be from inside the country, it has to be from the same civil society which already showed the world. I mean, if you ask this question in the 90s, would the Lebanese rise against Hezbollah, you'd have 20 journalists, including, I don't want to name, but including many who are very sympathetic to Hezbollah, who would say, Hezbollah is loved, Hassan Nasrallah is the hero. Well, we saw that 80% of the Lebanese sees otherwise when they demonstrate freely, when they elect freely. And that's, that's a massive argument that terminated that other argument. But now reality is, you've got to have inside Lebanon a coalition of political forces that is determined, that is actually determined to lead that struggle against Hezbollah to begin with. But at the same time, you've got to have an international community that responds to that call. If you compare with other similar situations, not completely identical, but comparable, uh, such as in East Timor or in southern Sudan today or in many other places, maybe in Yugoslavia. You may have a local resistance that is facing off, in this case, with Hezbollah and the full-fledged support of Iran, a, a regional superpower. But you, if you don't have a policy internationally, a policy, not just an attitude and a speech, an actual real policy that would articulate with the inside resistance, it may go difficult. So what is needed now is to begin here in Washington to have at least a consensus between the forthcoming Congress a few days from now and the administration that there should be a policy in Lebanon, on Lebanon, and with my, you know, all respects to all who have been working on the issue, that should go beyond just uh, seeing what spare parts we should send to the Lebanese army. That is not a policy. That is a management. Uh, we're not here to look at what are the needs of the helicopters of the Lebanese army. We're talking about a policy of the dimension of East Timor, for example, or the Balkans. That is number one. And number two in Lebanon, obviously, we need to, to see where the politicians are willing to go. Uh, some of them have already, you know, traveled to Tehran. Uh, the Prime Minister of Lebanon, this is a political reality, traveled to Tehran. So we're going to have a question about what can we do from traveling to Tehran in order to contain Hezbollah. I will open with these remarks. Obviously, there are much more than that to discuss. All right. And with that, I want to turn to questions from the floor. Uh, we'll take the question on the outside of, of this row. The, the t top, the name of this panel was Hezbollah, Iran's foreign legion, and in that uh, vein, would you address Hezbollah's activities in the triangle in South America and Iran's actions with Venezuela having to do with missiles? I mean, unlike the other la lady, I see Hezbollah as a terrorist threat to the United States, which the United States is for some reason ignoring, um, and I'm, I'm interested in where you see Hezbollah in the drug trafficking issue tied in with Mexico as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot and if you want to add. Um, Hezbollah's presence across Latin America from Rio Grande to Terra de Fuego has been developing since the 80s. It's not something new. Since the 80s, as soon as Hezbollah reached in 1985 the borderline with security zone in Lebanon, it immediately secured a pad, a launching pad in Lebanon through the community it controls to reach as far as that community has emigrated. So Hezbollah can go to Africa, can go to Latin America, cannot go to China, to Taiwan, or to the Philippines, I mean, en masse, because there are communities from Nabatiye, from the Baka, who have families who have emigrated. So if you penetrate the community in Lebanon, you end up to wherever the diaspora of that community has ended up, from, from let me say, Dearborn down to uh, Argentina. The tri-border area has been known, as most of us probably know here, uh, which is between Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, as a uh, you know, lawless area. And it's not just Hezbollah, it's everybody from the 19th century, since the Jesuits left there, um, has been organizing uh, activities, illegal activities. Hezbollah took advantage of that, and from that area, 
they can call upon their members who are in Argentina or in Brazil or in other places to go for training for financial transactions and so on and so forth. That's the oldest one in Latin America. Then you move up north. The biggest, as you just mentioned, the biggest base of Hezbollah is in Venezuela, no doubt about it. And it's not a secret thing. It's in downtown Caracas. Hezbollah is, uh, has an open uh, presence. It's managed by the relationship, strategic relationship, which now has been formalized by an alliance between the Iranian regime and, Venez and Hugo's regime in, in Venezuela. From Venezuela, the headquarters, the hemispheric headquarters right now are in Caracas. They beam in all directions. We don't have time to go all over these directions. But certainly there is now a spot in Suriname. And all the allies of Venezuela, the regime's allies of Venezuela, have opened the path for whomever would come from the comrades from Venezuela, including Hezbollah. So you'd find them in, uh, as far as in Nicaragua and down uh, in, in the Andes. The most serious thing, I, I guess, and there were multiple statements made by members of Congress, including uh, Representative Sue Myrick recently, is the Hezbollah activity uh, south of our border. That's the most dangerous, but that, because that goes in alliance with local networks. I don't have the expertise on the local Mexican networks, but we have information that in some villages and towns and some hotels and motels, uh, Hezbollah elements meet with drug networks and they allow them. It, in, in reality, Hezbollah doesn't want to live there. It's not vacation spots, but it's a crossing spot into uh, the United States. Therefore, I think it's a direct threat against not just national security, homeland security. All right. All right. Next question. Uh, we'll go with the gentleman in the front. I'm Dion, Dion Pollock with the Zionist Organization of America. The difference between back when the uh, people power movement hit the streets and more than a million people actually demonstrated to, and today is really obvious. Is there any prospect of mass civil action and would Hezbollah weapons be deployed against the average people of Lebanon if they tried to do such a thing and is that why they don't? Okay, that's a question that has to do with projections so I'll try my best and I know on this one, analysts could differ. Even if the analysts who are trying to see how civil society can resist Hezbollah or international community can act, we are divided on the issue. So let me express what I think uh, could and would happen. Um, it's all in the assessment of Hezbollah's war room and their Iranian backers and the Syrian, Syrian backers. I mean, they don't have a model that would apply immediately. They will take a sense of what to do at the time if they see the dimension of what happens. That's precisely what happened in 2005. I mean, in normal times in the 90s, if you recall, one little demonstration in Beirut, and at the time it was only East Beirut that would move, and you would, they would send the police, then the secret police, then the intelligence, then the, kid, the, the, the youth would be in jail or they will flee the country. What happened in 2005 was above and beyond the preparedness of Hezbollah, Syria, uh, Lebanese state uh, possibility to, to respond because of two things happening at the same time. The one important thing was the international community stance. That's very important. Post 9-11, U.S. and Europe. Post Iraq, U.S. and, and Europe. Post issuing of 1559 resolution, U.S. and Lebanon and, and in Europe was different from everything that was there in the 90s where at one point there were U.S. diplomats in the Baqa Valley, I don't want to name now, who have said, well, if the, if the Hezbollah attacks Israelis, it's fine, but if they attack U.S. citizens and, you know, it's not fine. The U.S. diplomats were, were so far into caving in to Hezbollah, to the position that was after 9-11. So again, if in the next weeks or months there will be a new game changer, should it be the indictments or other than the indictments? It all depends on what Washington is going to do, to be very clear about it. If the attitude is going to be, we don't want to meddle, this is a domestic affair of Lebanon, and you know what I mean, quote, unquote. It's, when, it's similar to when 1.5 million Iranians took the streets, and the voice in Washington was, we don't want to meddle. If that is the voice, then the Lebanese could do a lot of things that will be crushed at the end of the day. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, if the Lebanese would react by mass demonstrations, it is my assessment that Hezbollah is going to measure very carefully what to do. Yes, they have the power to go 
take the streets. They've done it. And that's why maybe we should reread what happened in May 8 and 7 in Beirut and not consider it as Hezbollah marching through the city. I would call on experts to reread what happened, the events, because the actual events on the ground were different from the rushing of the politicians to Doha and concluding the deals. The push that you put on the politicians is one thing and reality on the ground. Because in Lebanon, right. a terrorist organization, I'm going to conclude with this, is a terrorist organization under it fights another force on the ground, then it becomes a militia. Meaning if they're going to push the Lebanese and push them and push them, then we'll go back to square one before Taif and Hezbollah will be reduced to just a militia. Okay. All right. We'll take the one in the back. And Sarah Stern, Endowment for Middle East Truth. Um, as you know, um, several weeks ago, uh, perhaps a month ago, the U.S. Congress lifted its ban to the weapons um, that they were giving to the Lebanese armed forces. And I spoke to a lot of people on Capitol Hill about this, and they said to me with a tremendous degree of certitude that there was no way that any of these weapons could ever make their way to Hezbollah. Could you comment on the relationship between the LAF and Hezbollah and um, whether or not this is um, actually a given, um, number one? Number two, um, our last speaker, um, or in the last panel, Ambassador Lebrani had said that the greatest weapon that we have in our, Iran is the Iranian people um, and was more or less begging for the administration to say a word of support about the Iranian dissidents. Um, wondering if um, that holds true to the Lebanese people and if you could grade this administration in terms of the support that they've given to Arab dissidents. Thank you. I'll address the first part, which is um, Lebanese army, and then you address the other part. <laughs> I'll go with that. Uh, <laughs> quickly speaking, with regard to uh, Lebanese army and Hezbollah, to be very candid about it again, not in diplomatic language, but in research language. The current Lebanese army leadership and hierarchy that exists today is inherited from the same leadership and hierarchy that existed before the Cedars Revolution. It has never seen before that a revolution hits a country. There is a change of the cabinet, but the actual institutions remains the same. The current president of the republic, General Michel Slayman, was the commander-in-chief of the Lebanese army appointed under the Syrian occupation. I'm just putting very raw you know, information here. So on the political level only, it would be rather difficult, if not impossible, that this command by itself, when it receives weapons from here or from Russia or from Iran, is going to move with those weapons to take action against Hezbollah, either disarm Hezbollah or even contain Hezbollah. And we've got three, four examples whereby Hezbollah's weapons or their supporters, because they have allies, have been walking and demonstrating and using violence against the other side, and the Lebanese army allowed this to happen, including the coup of May of 2008. So that's on the political ground. On the sending the weapons to the Lebanese army, the, what, what has been talked about are you know, some spare parts and what have you that serves as an insurance that the United States defense apparatus still has good relations with the Lebanese defense apparatus, but it won't seriously go beyond that. Yeah, light, lightning round. Wrap, yeah, wrap the, the second part is very simple. I've summarized it already earlier, that the United States administration so far, we'll see about the Congress in a few weeks from now, doesn't have a policy of actual support to the Cedars Revolution and the Lebanon civil society, other than the help that the Lebanese, the U.S. Embassy, of course, and thankfully is, is disseminating, but a strategic policy as we had with Eastern Europe or with East Timor, we don't have. I don't think we have. Hi, Steve Lyman with IPT. Um, I'm wondering, outside of the material support prosecutions we've seen in the U.S., do you have a sense of whether or not there is any operational cells for Hezbollah within the U.S., and if so, what, if any, role would they play in the event of a strike on Iranian nuclear facilities? Ten years ago or so, when we developed research looking at the capacities of Al-Qaeda and the Salafi Jihadi networks, I, among many people, said, basically, you look at the literature, how far the literature is disseminated, you've got your pool, and then you do the percentages. Well, I can say and testify, and some colleagues would, that the literature of Hezbollah in the United States is at least as large, at least as large as the Salafi Jihad a few years ago, which means to me by way of projection 
probably I would be more daring than my colleague saying that Hezbollah do possess cells and presence here. The difference is that while Al-Qaeda and the Salafi acquire target and hit because they are at war, uh, Hezbollah is in a back burner situation. They acquire target and wait for the actual Iranians to move. And your triggering point, us engaging the Iranians or the Israelis, could be the, the, the map of when then we will know what Hezbollah assets are in the United States. All right. There's a half a finger raised from Ms. Lopez here. Half a finger means important. Important. Uh, I was just going to add very quickly that we know that um, some years ago, uh, George Tenet, when he was still director of CIA, uh, spoke publicly uh, and, and said that they, at that time, uh, back in the earlier part of this decade, were tracking as many as or more than 12 uh, Hezbollah cells in the United States at that time. And in Canada, too. Yeah. All right. Next question. We'll go with the gentleman in the front. This front. And, uh, no, I'm, I'm showing you that I, I've acknowledged you, but we'll go with this, this gentleman first. Okay. Hi. Um, Sorry. Yusuf Ibrahim. Uh, I, both Walid and, and Tony uh, raised the issue of uh, the two main players are Iran and, uh, uh, and Israel. So how about the Israeli side of the coin? I mean, under what circumstances would Israel decide to take out Hezbollah? It seems to me just tying on to the conversation you just had, for Hezbollah to decide to become operative in the United States would be suicidal because it would, we would certainly then want to give the Israelis a green light. But separately, would the Israelis decide to act? And give us, uh, Walid, if you will, an objective assessment of what happened in 2006. My impression is Hezbollah got a beating. Okay, and quickly. Uh, I would recommend usually when we ask the question about Israel assessment of uh, when it would unleash its strength against Hezbollah. The best sign is the Israelis to respond because their mechanism of dec decision on Hezbollah is very complex and uh, very internal and, and involves a lot of uh, the decision centers in, in the country. But it also involves a coordination and some coordination with the United States. And it also involves the regional readiness of Iran and Syria, which brings me to 2006 the assessment then and the Israelis themselves and their own reports later on when they evaluated the war thought that there could have been other alternatives uh, to what they have done, the, the, the machinery. But I'll, give it, I'll leave that to the Israeli uh, analysts to, to address it. I would say, with regard to Hezbollah, Israeli, American, and international assessment is without an actual uprooting of Hezbollah's not just military force, but capacity of regenerating that force when the withdrawal will occur, because any operation is followed by a withdrawal. We, we've seen that. Is the tipping point, and Hezbollah knows that. Hezbollah think that they can wither any invasion, any attack, especially from the air, as long as they can re-emerge. Now, what makes the re-emergence possible, that was mentioned by Tony, is Hezbollah's ability to re-communicate or to communicate all the way quickly with its regional backer. So that would be the Lebanese-Syrian borders. As long as the Lebanese-Syrian borders are open to Hezbollah, any operation, Israeli multinational force or even Lebanese army, is not going to be able to reverse the fate of, uh, of Hezbollah, in my sense.